Okay, so we're going to resume with our um, mediation exercise on the case study. so far. Um, Jeremy and uh, Redford, district attorney. Um, Anthony Gatica for these attorneys. John Jonathan. I've got Carla for Alicia so far. So, um, Jeremy, would you mind sort of maybe moving over to the two seats that are straight in front of me? Sure. sure. Just having trouble seeing me. And don't move over too far just in case uh, Sharon comes. She was the GAL. I haven't, I haven't heard from her whether she's coming in or not. Perfect. where you're all uh, counsel or, or at least um, sort of professional people that know the law somewhat. I'm going to try to ask you about specific cases because now you've read all of them by now um, and you know how they play out in terms of the black letter law or in terms of your case. So for example, you know, Rick and uh, Jeremy where you're the district attorneys, you know, what kind of issues do you have with your case in light of the case law that's been decided, as well as the statute. We got into the statute a lot uh, last class, 233-81. Um, DCF, uh, again, I'd be asking you to, you know, how are you basically proving a case based on a lot of hearsay stuff. Again, a lot of the case law uh, alludes to hearsay and how it can be used and whatnot and what's going to amount to clear and convincing evidence of these um, unfitness. Then these attorneys, Anthony and uh, Gatika, um, you know, you want to talk about specifically sort of, you know, his procedural due process rights in both the current protection case and the criminal case where both would be different. Another thing we would be talking about um, is, uh, and again, this, we're only predicting because right now both cases are open and you've just been, you know, asked to come into this room and see if any kind of uh, uh, resolution can be formed around both of those cases, but we don't know which one will go to trial first, and does that matter, and in what way does it matter? Um, and lastly, at some point, we'll also get to the role of Children's Council, whether we get that to that today or um, Thursday, um, with the peculiar um, issues faced by, first of all, Alicia and Jason's counsel, and then uh, uh, Jonathan, the younger child's uh, um, counsel. So um, let's start with the uh, criminal case and getting back to some of the issues that were um, raised last time uh, about the uh, case of uh, Commonwealth versus uh, Mr. Lee for the alleged uh, rape and sexual assault of Alicia um, and Jason, his uh, two um, children. Who would like to address me first, whether it's, I don't care if it's a district attorney's or a father's council, but I want to talk about some of these issues and how, um, again, 
you know, what, what the burden of proof is of the trial, what particular issues might come up in terms of uh, um, particular uh, rights that father has in proceedings like this and how they might play out. Well, so, I guess we can break the sure. district attorney. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the biggest thing, or what I have found to support our uh, introduction of evidence in regards to the children's testimony. Uh, is going to be uh, utilizing rules 81 and 83. Uh, and, and it would be just 81, just to clarify, would be 81 for you, whereas 83 would apply to the department's case. I got really confused with yeah. that because I thought that there was a way we could wiggle 83 into our, ours as well. No, section 83 is for care and protection cases backing up section 82. <laughs> Should the department seek at some point to make it an adoption termination case, then Section 82 would apply, and 81 applies to the criminal the criminal cases. So it's 81 that you would deal with in regard to Jason's statements, along with, for example, the Colin case. And that was because of the age, right? Uh, well, they're all for children under 10, Yeah. but Section 81 pertains specifically to criminal cases. So if we were to, right. if we were to piggyback on 83 with their when they're operating on 83 for Alicia? No. We, we couldn't piggyback off that and use that no, as... Uh, what's the problem with Alicia? She's over 10. She's over 10. So the only Jason's statements apply in terms of the statute. Okay? Okay. So either Katika or Anthony, even with Section 81, are there any... Uh, sort of peculiar, I don't know, issues that you might have. I mean, would you, are you going to end up conceding that the Commonwealth could at least get in Jason's statements under Section 81? So the Commonwealth, what, what, what specifically the Jeremy or Rick would you, as the Commonwealth, be um, able to show under Section 81 to get Jason's statements in? We, we would look at, um, we would be looking at cooperating the statements, the out-of-court statements, with the, um, with other evidence, uh, which we would include, which we would introduce as being uh, the interviews conducted by uh, the social worker, uh, the police officer, the exam that was conducted. But so number one, you feel like you, you have corrobor corroboration. Yes. What specific uh, guidelines, again, that under the statute and, uh, and under college, uh, do you have to show and, and you feel you'd be able to show? Uh, it, I believe there are two, two guidelines, or, or two, two steps we So you're looking at 81 and or Commonwealth versus Colin. I believe that's the case, yes. Yes, it is. Commonwealth versus Colin. Yes. Um, first, in order to provide the defendant with a meaningful opportunity to respond to hearsay allegations. So tell me what that means. What are you going to do if, you, if you're going to seek, be seeking to use Section 81? We're going to be providing the defense counsel with the information that we have obtained and that we intend on using for You're giving them notice? Yes. All right. So Lee gets uh, some a procedural right regarding yes. this is this is what we're going to do. We're going to seek to introduce Jason's statements. Right. Okay. What else do you have to do? Uh, we'll be requesting a separate hearing. Okay. Uh, regarding the reliability of a child's witness out of court statement. Uh, for that what do you know? have to show regarding the need for the procedure in the first place? Can you just say, okay, we're going to do this? Uh, that, it, that it's more probative than prejudicial. Where are you reading? Um, <laughs> I had it in my notes. So. <laughs> it sounds good, but I don't know if you're reading from Section 81. <laughs> the statute says that. Uh, oh, where? What, what, what paragraph of what statute says that? 81A. 81A? 1, 2, 3, 4. Oh, five lines down. Per five, paragraph. Yep, yep. Probative. 81A? 81, 81 yeah, 231, section 81, section A, 
since um, the statement is offered as evidence of material fact and is more probative on the point for which it is offered. Okay, yeah, it's not probative versus pre prejudicial. It's more probative on the point for which it is offered than any other evidence. This is what we've got in terms of Jason's statements, right? Um, it's evidence of material fact that Jason was allegedly you know, sexually assaulted and or raped by his dad. Um, it's more probative than any other evidence because we don't really have any other evidence. The person to whom the statement was made, right, right and Jason was specifically uh, um, interviewed by who, Jeremy? Uh, social worker, I think it was. Gonna tell, you're gonna, the Commonwealth's going to call, right. no matter what, they're going to call the, the, the uh, um, captain as well, the police woman. Uh, the, um, what else do we need? And this is where the court would come into play, because you're giving them notice of a hearing, right, that you're going to conduct before the judge, in order to then, at trial, let in Jason's statements, right? right. So what else do you have to show? To, no, to the court. Oh, is the child incompetent or unavailable? Just read the statute. Under the age of 10. I don't have the statute right now. Okay. I'm going to have it up in one second. Okay. All right. Did somebody want to help? Go ahead, Elizabeth. The, re the reliability of his statements. Okay. Before that, before you even look at the statements themselves, what does the Commonwealth have to show to the judge in order to get Jason's statements in? Child's not able to testify? Yeah, unavailability, right? So those are, those are kind of the two uh, uh, factors, right? Unavailability, reliability. And that's because of Lee's what kind of rights? <laughs> Anthony? Uh, those are his rights. Uh, Conscious, yeah, under the Constitution, so constitutional rights. Yeah. yeah. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So what what would you be showing, uh, again, as the Commonwealth, as to Jason's unavailability? Is it that he's incompetent to stand trial? Do you think you, you can show that Jason's incompetent? Because of his who's, age. Who's Jason's attorney? Is your is your client incompetent? Not to my knowledge. Well, because well, of his age. Does that automatically assume incompetence? And it also protects him from. Right, right. <laughs> He's unwilling. There are a number of ways you can show unavailability. Think about Jason and the situation. How can you show that he, you've got to show that, that, that you've got uh, this need, compelling need for this under, procedure? Under, but, num, um, under num, uh, number five, the court finds based on expert testimony from a treating uh, psychiatrist, psychologist, or clinician, the testifying would likely be would likely to cause severe psychological or emotional trauma to the child. So you might hang your hat on that to, to argue to the court and, and prove to the judge before you can introduce his statements that uh, you don't want him getting on the stand, he might be traumatized, and you obviously would then need um, uh, an expert to testify on that. I just saw John's hand go I was just saying, he's unwilling, right? It seems like he's kind of, he's not saying any abuse took place now. Okay, and where is that in the in the um, factors? You could you could probably fit on the number three. The child testifies to a let. Well, he would have to testify. The child testifies to a lack of memory. And then number one. The child is unable to be present because of death, physical, or mental illness testify. or infirmity. <laughs> oh. Oh. Oh, let's see, let's try another one. <laughs> um, and that's why Rick was picking on the child who's not competent to testify. That, that is probably not the situation. Uh, again, maybe number five, but you you would have to have you know an expert um, testify and a clinician that has um, you know um, treated with him. Okay, what about reliability? 
say you can show unavailability. What is it about Jason's statements and the context in which they were made that you can argue that they were, were reliable? So who did he make them to? In what context? When he was speaking with one of the social workers, he pointed the thing specifically on the on the body chart. Yeah, what else? So it says in 23381 the judge should consider the following factors, okay, for reliability. No. The clarity of the statement, the child's capacity to observe, remember, or give expression to the what she had seen, heard, provided, blah, blah, blah. The time, content, and circumstances, the child's sincerity, et cetera, right? So I'm, still hung, I'm, sorry. That? I'm yeah. still hung up on the incompetent thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that we could show, I think we could ask the judge to examine the evidence that we have at this point. What evidence? The, um, the interviews that were conducted by the social worker, the way the child reacted mm -hmm. uh, initially to the officer and the social worker during the initial interview. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, could, we could make a case showing that um, he's unable to tell the truth at the time of the trial and does not know the consequences of telling the truth in court. I don't know if, if there was enough to distinguish that he has that ability because he was kind of flip-flopping. So you're going back to unavailability. Right I'm, I'm just talking oh, right that's up. That's all right. That's okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. I get pretty stubborn, so. All right. <laughs> that I, is. I it. think that would that's one of the one of the ways we would try to get him in as being incompetent, which would allow it, allow. As that would point to his unavailability. Right. Right. Yes. And that's why he's not going to testify, and that's why the statements Certainly. come in. So then, when we want to look at the st uh, the statements and the judge making a finding of reliability, yeah. then what are you looking at? You're looking at the initial interview, the context in which it was made, what he said, what he did, what he pointed to, as Jeremy said, right? Yeah. Um, and he so, downplayed the, the actual sexual acts as being wrestling. Mm -hmm. um, so he, he has a hard time distinguishing when it's time to tell the truth and when it's not time to tell the truth. And we think that that would muddy the waters in court. Okay, again, but you're going back to him being unavailable. I okay, want you to right. concentrate on this second part of it. Are the statements reliable? Gotcha. I think DCF wants to help you. I don't know. I see both of the hands up. Maybe not help. <laughs> All right. Um, I think we mentioned this in last class too. Like I, I think that it's true that even if he went back on what he said, or mm -hmm. he seemed, you know, wishy-washy about what he did say, mm -hmm. when he did make the statements, at least to, I think it was to Ellen when she was alone with him after he started to cry yeah, with Leisha yeah, in the room. Yeah, yeah. He like specifically said what was done, and if, mm -hmm. I don't know if a seven-year-old would be able to really articulate. He wasn't seven. Well, however, how ten. ten. Well, nine. We're saying he's just under ten, so we can talk about the stats. A statute. seven, eight, nine, <laughs> ten-year-old maybe shouldn't know like exactly how to maybe describe the kind of stuff that he did describe. Okay. Do come yeah, up with. and that would indicate that they were reliable. Yeah, just because he's so young and. The average ten-year-old probably doesn't know okay. or shouldn't know. And then, in, okay. in, in, if I may add to uh, what Elizabeth is saying, in, a, in an interview with the social workers, it did not, it, she was not confused to describe what she went through. And um, other experts, which is the statute, say if the expert also can corroborate what the um, Alicia said. Uh, we also have made similar observations. Don't talk about Alicia yet. Um, just, just statute. since they raised because right now the, the Commonwealth raised no, the statute. Just, just so just, the statute only relates to Jason. That's statements. A Jason, yeah. Okay. Because Alicia was twelve anyways. Yes. So so, so it was Jason. Jason uh, what he said after it was uh, after it was confronted the second the first time it was uh, trying to hide because he was probably uh, ashamed of talking about it or trying to be protected further, but the second time when he was in a room with the, the social worker and the police, and when they told him not to lie, he wasn't confused about how he described the event. I think we can show that what he said in our room, and uh, also the uh, what the uh, the psychologist, the clinician, the social worker said. Okay, we can and since that. I'm now hearing from DCF, and we're talking about Jason's article statements, 
you want to look at section 83, you have to show a lot less than the Commonwealth has to show to get Jason's statements in. So what's your burden, either Elizabeth or John Paul, uh, to get Jason's statements in? Uh, we just need to uh, identify um, who the, the statement person. was made. The person that the statement was made to. So you did that by Ellen, and she's going to testify. Okay. And the judge has to find that the statement is offered as evidence of a material fact that is more appropriate okay. than on the point for which it is offered than any other evidence which the proponent can procure through reasonable effort. So it's all that. <laughs> I think just as similar to 81, just. It is it. similar to 81 in the sense that when you read the um, Rebecca case, right? Um, Rebecca was for the um, for, for, for section 83. And while the court said that, that, that um, the unavailability requirement is absent from the care and protection proceeding, okay? But the court also said that a judge kind of still has to assess whether Jason's statements are reliable. Um, so it's not as, as um, again, it, uh, obviously with the criminal case, it's more dependent on Lee's constitutional rights. Uh, so the emphasis on the care and protection case having to do with protection of children, right? So less stringent standard on the agency. Is that why the unavail unavailability section is kind of not there? It's, it's not, not there at all. It's not required. And really, the reliability stage, uh, the section is not, is not there either. But you do have the SJC and Rebecca saying, well, the judge kind of still has to assess reliability. Um, so you wouldn't need a, a psychotherapist or a social worker to come in and testify? Well, you might be able to just make your own argument. and convince the judge that the statement should come in um, based on, like, uh, the, 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 here's our proffered um, evidence that we will be um, uh, introducing at trial. Um, and the adequate statements of this child will be introduced through the person that the child spoke to. It was made in the context of um, a, a 51B emergency investigation. Uh, the, the, the child spoke in specific language about specific and you know, again, et cetera. So you're, in the end, you're doing something similar than the district attorneys are doing, um, but they've got to do it on the record. You have to have a hearing on it, the judge has to find by preponderance before um, Jason's statements actually get introduced. Right. So now that I have a better, better understanding of uh, 81, yeah. CI, where are you? You're in 81? Yeah, 81, section CI. It seems like we'll be stepping on the carpet a little bit of um, trying to The clarity of the statement, yeah. the meaning the child's capacity to observe, remember, and give expression to which the child has seen, heard, uh, or experienced, provided that it shall be supported by expert testimony. So in the end, you still need expert so testimony. Yeah, yeah, it seems like we're stepping on the carpet a little bit of trying yeah. to show unavailability. Yeah. Uh, yeah. However, I think that the state can make a case where we needed to somewhat up the ante in order to get the truth. Mm -hmm. However, the on the record it would show that uh, he still had a problem with telling the truth, but ultimately uh, he was able to do that. Mm -hmm. So we could show that we could satisfy the unavailability prong as well as the... The reliability. Right. Unavailability and the reliability both at the same time. Anybody else uh, representing either the children or we? Um, want to speak to Jason's statements coming in under the statute. So we'll, leave, we'll kind of leave that point unless anyone has. Um, so these attorneys, are you going to have objection to that? Um, and if you I mean, do, I mean, do you think you'd be successful in arguing <coughs> against either the criminal protection case or the criminal case that Jason's statements can come in under the 81 or 83. I think with 83, it's it. Like, I, I don't think we have much of a shot. We could argue yeah. it to argue it just to do it. But okay. It, but uh, with 81. So you got to sort of concede yeah, that point. That. All right. But with 81, yeah, I would bring in, if they're going to do unavailable witness, I would say that Jason is competent enough to do it. Yeah, uh, my client has the right to have confidence. So you're saying they won't be able to prove unavailability? Yeah, I don't think they'll be able to. Because again, 
say because your client is competent, but Rick had other things to say about un unavailability. What else do you have to say? <laughs> <laughs> I think, think of number one. And, and uh, the, uh, the, 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 the child is not physical or mentally ill. So if I was uh, representing the, uh, the father, I would say that, uh, you know, especially that I know that this child may want to protect me, to protect the father, I would say that he's not physical ill or mentally ill, and uh, he could come and testify. Uh, yeah. Carry on. Look at number two. By the ruling of the court, the child is exempt on the ground of privilege from testifying concerning the subject matter of such statement. Would your client be claiming a, a privilege and not testifying, not taking the stand? Is could that subsection be used? And of course, it depends on what side you're ultimately on. I think you took the position that Jason would want to return to his uh, yeah. parents. Um, anybody have any thoughts on that one? By a ruling of the court, the child is exempt on the ground of privilege from testifying concerning the subject matter of such statement. Well, it doesn't seem like the privilege is automatic. Mm -hmm. You'll probably mm -hmm. have to present the reason why. <clears throat> You shouldn't be testifying whether... So think of a reason why you, as Jason's attorney, mm -hmm. might be informing the, the Commonwealth, and maybe DCF too, uh -huh. my client is not going to testify, he's claiming what? Can child say it's emotional distress or something? And speaking of privilege, I'll throw another thing out here, it's kind of a different uh, issue. Um, Obviously, we all know that in a criminal case, a defendant does not have to, does not have to testify against the privilege against self-incrimination. What about the camp protection? First of all, is your client going to testify? No, right? You don't want to do that, <laughs> right? Okay. So he's not going to testify in the criminal case, and of course, the burden of proof is then the obviously the Commonwealth that failure to testify can't be used against him. What about the camp protection case? I would put that off. I would try to get the criminal case done before anything because that would come in, wouldn't it? Anything That's that interesting is. too because the, uh, at least one case that you guys read, the uh, Jennifer case, if the criminal case does go first and he is convicted, then his conviction is going to be introduced. Um, that's custody of Jennifer. Then his um, conviction will be introduced in the camera protection case um, as, as relevant, not as everything, but as relevant to his fitness as a parent. So you, you probably, especially if Lee is looking to, to you, to both you know, keep him out of jail and get his children back, right? So that's another issue that's kind of like, yeah. it's on the table, it's kind of unresolvable like, but, as to what ends up going first, right? But realistically though, if he gets convicted of this, he's going away for a long time. Like, it's, it wouldn't, I wouldn't and, really... And we also have case law that, that, that um, conviction, incarceration too, in and of themselves is also, in and of itself, will no, is not enough to amount to parental fitness. So it depends on the circumstances, depends on uh, what the incarceration is for, it depends on how long, it depends on what bonds the child has formed with substitute caretakers, it depends on a lot of things. But you're probably right in that respect because he's probably facing, um, you know, a, a, a very long jail time if um, convicted. But getting back to how can you get him convicted? So you get Jason's statements in. What else becomes your criminal case, uh, Rick or Jeremy? What else do you have? Okay, you want to talk about Alicia? No, but in Alicia and Jason <laughs> together without the statute, right? What, what are other ways that you're going to get um, evidence in? What about the as first, first complaint? Okay, yeah, so let's talk about that. Okay. 
go ahead and talk about it. <laughs> um, so what kind of case law do we have relative to what initially was fresh complaint and gross complaint? What does the case law tell us about how the Commonwealth can use that document? I think the, when it, go ahead. I think the first case was Commonwealth v. King. I think it's where it actually... I did a little bit of research. The, the first was, complaint. And yeah. that was the yeah. first. But it goes really all the way back. Think of what the reason for um, someone getting on the stand saying this child or this woman or you know this victim came to me and said blah 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 when ordinarily it would sound like it's violating a defendant's confrontation rights. So what's the reason for allowing someone like that to testify, be that person, you know, a cop, a teacher, a parent? I think to, in some in some aspects to protect the witness because Especially in juvenile cases, it's usually done by somebody that the child knows. So they may be reluctant to, you know, run to a family member and say something in fear of you know, something might happen to them for that. So it, it kind of creates a almost like a safety zone for the child. So if they say it to a social worker or a police officer first, that person can be used as a witness where they have somebody that they can communicate with without fear of reprisal. Okay. So in what context is it done? So you have, um, say you just done a doubt rape, rape case, because this is how the doctrine first started. Uh, Commonwealth seeks to introduce um, law enforcement's uh, statement. She came to me and complained, blah, 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 and stated, blah, 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 right? What is the purpose of that person testifying that the victim came to him or her and made these statements? John? I think it's to corroborate the uh, victim's statements because the lawyer is not going to let him testify. The actual victim is not going to be able to testify. So okay. He's back so this. here's the problem. Um, Kala, who represents Alicia, Kenyon, who represents Jason, said that their clients are not going to testify. So even if you're going to do first complaint, and that would be Ellen or Kathy, whoever the children spoke to first, um, where's the corroboration that the children are not going to testify? There really isn't any. So you have a problem, don't you, with fresh or first complaint testimony? So even if you seek to introduce and the other side starts to object um, and you say, no, Your Honor, and when I'm not offering it as hearsay, it's first complaint evidence, the other side, meaning Lee and children's attorneys, uh, are going to say, Your Honor, I don't know how it can be first complaint testimony because the alleged victims, for whatever reason, trauma, privilege, etc., are not testifying in this case. What about, uh, didn't Justin, what about what Jason Okay, said? and I think I, 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 I um, related that uh, Justin might have been a real tool for, for both the DA and the D DCF to use. If Justin was around, um, he, and you know, and he was just as young as Jason, but um, and he testified, and there was evidence of uh, Justin being sexually assaulted by Lee. Uh, he would also be testifying in the department's case. However, the whole family just, as I said before, couldn't make this up. This actually happened. They disappeared. They left the state. They didn't want to be involved in either of the case, so the department lost pretty much, and the Commonwealth pretty much lost, you know, the star witness in terms of someone that also was in the picture that would testify. So what else so do we have? wouldn't we introduce the uh, first report under the unavailability? Because the witness is unavailable. Okay, you're, you're fine with, I think, Jason's, sta Jason's statements. So the only way that... Um, it's the same thing. 
Jason's statements are, are likely going to come in under Section 81. But will Alicia's statements come in? They can't come in under the statute because she's not under 10. Uh, they can't come in, probably not, as we're discussing right here, under first complaint. What about some of the hearsay? Um, uh, the hearsay uh, exceptions. Exceptions. <laughs> think of the word rather than um, that some of these cases talk about. So what's the department going to do um, relative to some of Alicia's statements? Be an excited utterance. Excited utterance in what case, if you remember, um, that would be helpful on that. Um, and besides excited utterance, you, you might as well mention the other ones because really only two state of are mind. in the state of mind. Okay. So some of the cases are again, Jennifer again. Jennifer in the state of mind. Yeah. Um, the Mikkel, the cake crossing case also stands for allowing and yeah. out of court statements of Alicia. Um, Could we try treatment of diagnosis also? Treatment towards diagnosis? In terms of what? Uh, having it as one of the other hearsay exceptions. So what do you mean by, two? okay, what you're trying to do is we're going to that first interview, right? Those are the statements you want to get in because after that first interview, and they were, children were spoken to afterwards, um, they never uh, make those same statements again. So Ellen and Kathy were merely investigators. They weren't, okay. you know, involved in treatment. That would have been down the line and That's say right. that they kept speaking to other people, which they didn't. I thought they, no, they didn't. They okay. didn't. <laughs> so they did, okay, got it? Yeah. Yeah. Did we mention that we can, we could, uh, did you mention that we could also use the exception of substantive evidence? This substantive evidence. Oh, where are you looking, Jim Paul? Are you looking at any specific case for that? Or? It's a, no, yeah, actually it's in a, the section 81, uh, but it was uh, in the notes that we covered in the class sometimes ago. Before Jennifer, or in Jennifer, I think. It was uh, the... Uh, but I'm confused as to whether you're talking about a hearsay exception Say, right yes. now? Yes, hearsay exception. Is that what you're asking? The, uh, yeah, I wasn't asking for hearsay exceptions, yeah, I, but I I'm not following. Uh, I see the substantive evidence is also can be one of them, I think, under a section A1. Is it? Substantive. Substantive. Not sure what you mean. <laughs> I, th I think it says, uh, uh, out of statement. Oh, you're reading the, sort of the overall, again, yeah. and we're not talking about the statute. Traditional hearsay exceptions would be spontaneous utterance, excited utterance, state of mind. Um, but again, what we have to be careful of, the, the, both the department and the uh, Commonwealth may be able to get some of these statements in. Maybe, but if they come in, in what respect are they used by the court, by the judge, by the judge in either the criminal case or the camera protection um, case? So say it was to prove, you know, Alicia's state of mind, that, you know, she says, I hate him and he's a child molester, right? Your Honor, I'm not trying to, but, oh, I know where you got this. I, Your Honor, I'm not the, trying to get them in substantively, <laughs> But the purpose of getting them in is to show Alicia's state of mind at the time. So again, it goes to the hearsay exception of state of mind. Um, yeah, so that's another uh, uh, um, aspect, right, of getting in some of the statements. All right, okay. State of mind, excited utterance. Maybe even Jason has some, but again, Jason's more than likely will come in um, under the statute. Um, it, you never answer this, this question when I talked before about Lee's um, not taking the stand in the criminal case, and that can be used against him. Um, what about Lee's not taking the stand, um, and I'm asking the department this question, in the camp protection case? In what way, if at all, can the judge use that? The fact that Lee, the parent, in the care protection case, is 
not going to testify. She's going to sit and watch. And yes, the petitioner's got the burden, right? What's the burden? Clean uh, convincing evidence of current parental fitness. Um, can the judge, again, in the care protection case, take into account, because if the judge is going to adjudicate the children in need of care protection, the judge has to make right specific findings about the father's unfitness. So some of the findings might be um, out of court statements of Jason goes to the truth, right? Out of court statements of Alicia does not go to the truth, but I'm letting them in and I'm weighing them just for her state of mind, for her excited utterance, you know, what she what was going through her mind at the time. I'm not letting them in to prove the abuse, okay? Um, Dad doesn't testify. Can I say anything about that as the judge? Can I weigh that at all? Kyle says no. Why? Is the, is the camera protection case a criminal case? So does that privilege apply? Does Lee enjoy the same sort of privileges and due process rights in the camera protection case that he has in the criminal case? What's at stake in the criminal case? Yeah, jail. What's at stake in the in the care protection case? Lose custody. Lose custody. You know, maybe termination, depending on you know what's going on too. Um, so does the privilege against self-incrimination apply? John's saying no, <laughs> and he's looking. <laughs> And you're correct. Based, based on a standard of uh, proof, I think you shouldn't. Um, you should not apply. It's one of the inferences that the judge can draw. Okay, again, it can't be everything, just like incarceration. It can't be everything. But the judge can draw an inference of unfitness. Think about it for a minute. You know, so a parent here is facing his or her losing custody of his or her children, right? And the parent is either A, not even because someone not present in the courtroom, right? Either not even there, or they're there. No, I'm not testifying. Right? How can right? you draw an inference from this? Yeah. I have a question. If the, uh, the father, Lee, is not contesting the, uh, the, the custody. If Lee's not contesting? Yeah. He is contesting, by the way. Yeah. And that was and the reason for this if, it, if it's contesting, it doesn't testify to prove that, you know, to prove that he is a fit parent? Yeah, he's contesting in the sense that oh, no. he's got an attorney that's advocate, actively advocating, you know, against the department getting custody. Yeah. But Lee himself doesn't speak, doesn't take the stand. So then again, that's an inference against um, his unfitness. Um, what else? There was. Um, but he cannot be compelled to testify, can he? Again, no. Okay. He can be. The department can call him. You can certainly call whoever you want as witnesses. You could even call the kids. And again, you might have counsel with kids saying, you know, they're not going to testify because of trauma. They're not going to testify also because of privilege or whatever. Um, so, so certainly you can call, but they can't be um, compelled to um, to testify. Nick's not here, but he represented the um, investigator. And remember, we talked about what his report contained, and that would have been. Even though he spoke to all of the parties, his report contained hearsay. Um, he never got, as Ellen and Kathy did, direct statements from Jason and Alicia that my father sexually abused me. Um, what he got was a bunch of other statements. Ellen and Kathy saying, this is what Jason and Alicia said. Um, Lee saying, you know, this is what really happened. Jason and Alicia saying, this is what really happened, etc. Um, he 
files this report containing the hearsay and totem pole hearsay and whatnot. Um, how is that report? First of all, does is can that report come in at all as evidence in the criminal case? No. Nothing true. Even though you're getting you're getting information, remember this: the department, uh, the district attorney, from when. Uh, from when a 51A first comes in alleging um, sexual assault of a child, the district attorney's office is getting that information. That doesn't mean that information would necessarily be admissible as trial. They're using it to investigate. They're using it to gather their own evidence, their own witnesses, et cetera. Um, so the court-appointed investigator, again, has nothing to do um, with the criminal case. And everything to do with the care protection case. That person is appointed right from the get-go, right? The day that a care protection case is filed is um, talked about in Section 21A as a, a, a qualified expert. That person also testifies. So not only would Nick's report come in, he also would testify and be subject to cross-examination. What would he be testifying to for the department? So again, as I said before, he's not getting direct evidence of any sort. But what's he testifying to? And in what way can the judge use um, his testimony, his report, to um, maybe be part of your uh, factors for unfitness of plea? Elizabeth? Corroboration, maybe. How is Nick a corroborator of anyone? Well, he's getting all of the information from everyone else. Mm -hmm. What else, John? I was going to say, like, the hearsay out of court statements of um, the victims and the participants, like the kids mm -hmm. and the judge, can use that information. If he testifies, he can draw an inference from that inference, information. What kind of inference? Uh, positive inference. As far a what? As positive inference. Positive. Like what do you mean by positive? Him. To who? He can, um, he can believe, he can use that as evidence against Lee. Okay. Whereas in a criminal case, he couldn't. Okay. Like it wouldn't okay. be allowed to testify. Okay. And close to what Elizabeth is saying with the word corroboration in a sense, yeah. Um, So if I were to look at, um, starting with the department, if you would just list, list your evidence, district attorney to think about it for a minute, list your evidence, and then we and um, the, the children, um, if you have any, any, uh, arguments about whether that evidence is going to, in a criminal case, amount to beyond a reasonable doubt, and in the care protection case, going to amount to clear and convincing evidence. Just think about that for a minute. Just all of the evidence that you would present, if you're the department, you, that you would present and get in successfully, if you're, the, if you're the Commonwealth, get in successfully for your case. Um, and again, what, what issues the other side would have, um, and whether they think, in fact, the Commonwealth of the, you know, the department would be, um, would be successful. Start with the department? In the uh, statements, such as the social workers' um, statements, and Be more specific. So Jason's will definitely come in. So Jason's right. under 83. Right. Okay. What else? I think some of Alicia's may be under 81. No. She's not under 10. I'm just kidding. Yeah. Not under <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> some of Alicia's under. But as exceptions to the hearsay rule. Uh, okay. As either Except an excited utterance or a state of mind. Okay. Excited utterance, state of mind exceptions. What else? We just talked about it. Just, just talked about it. 
The investigation. The investigative report. report and testimony. Anything else? But the, uh, the similar but the clinic, clinic the, uh, the clinicians, because the, uh, the, uh, the clinicians report. We don't have a clinicians report. What about Lee? Please. The, oh, the, um, the, the criminal, the, 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 the statement from the, the, arrest, the arrest records or the uh, police department? No. Nope. The conviction for Jason, uh, I'm sorry, Justin? He's we don't have a conviction. He disappeared. Spoke, didn't He's you what? speak with the, um, the social worker or somebody? Yes. Social worker? Yes. Oh, yeah. You neglected to talk about that, so you might be able to get in, right? The uh, admission against party interest, whatever statements he had initially. And there were eight kinds of statements. He wasn't specific like the children were, um, so he may be able to get those as uh, uh, statements against the party's interest in the care protection case. And then um, last, his failure to testify, and we just talked about that. And I think that's pretty much it for the care protection case, unless anybody can think of anything else the, for the department's case. Anthony? Yeah? Is there anything else? No, no, I'm just writing everything down. Okay, what about the criminal case, guys? Oh, just list like they just did. All right, uh, I guess I would start with trying to introduce the 51A report that was filed. No. Really? Yeah. Not a good start. <laughs> no. All right, the police report and the police officer that took the report? Yeah, yeah. Okay. The um, interview that was conducted by the social worker and yeah. the social worker? Yep, yeah, so we got in Jason first. Right, Jason statute. first, yeah. Yeah. Um, we would look, be looking to introduce the children's disclosure of the, uh, or the child's disclosure of the sexual assaults that took place. Who? The child's disclosure. Disclosure. What's up? Uh, both Justin and Jason. Justin? Is he the neighbor? You got a problem. He's gone. Okay. So you have no information about him. Yeah. Uh, so it would be Jason's under uh, 81, under 10. Under 81. Right. Yep. And then also, like they said, with Alicia's excited utterance. Some of her parts of hers. Mm -hmm. Father's statements, you may or may not be able to get in. So, here's a question now for both state agencies, the department and DCF. You obviously, I think we've all arrived arrived at a point that we know there's problems. And as the SJC said in one of these cases here, um, in fact, it's really good language, so I want to point it out. It was in, uh, uh, um, in Rebecca. Uh, they generally, I know, witnesses to an act of abuse other than the victim and the perpetrator. Corroborative evidence often will be lacking. A youthful victim, although truthful, may be a poor witness, may refuse, or may be unable to testify. Guilt about breaking up the family or a child's desire to remain with his or her parents on the front. A retraction of a truthful allegation of abuse. A child's memory fades rapidly and statements made closer in time to incidents of abuse may be um, more accurate. So while both the department attorneys, uh, uh, um, district attorneys, professionals uh, may have really believed that something indeed did happen, but recognizing that they've got problems with their evidence, right? What kind of, of um, deal <laughs> might you offer to lead in children's um, attorneys. Recognizing that if you go to trial, you might not be able to meet your burden. You know what I'm saying? Right? And he would know, and they would know, that they would be taking a chance as well to go to trial. Although they recognize that um, not only do you have the burden as the state, but the evidence just isn't there. Um, and by the way, we've got to mention, but we mentioned it before, there's the absence of physical evidence as well. The children were indeed um, treated by um, medical professionals, and there was, again, no, no 
um, evidence of physical sexual abuse. So what kind of deal? What kind of deal would you take, children's attorneys or, or lease attorneys? You know, the district attorney is not going to want to just totally, you know, cross and dismiss the case. Neither is the department going to immediately give the children back. But is there a... Um, um, I was just thinking possibly the deal could be that Lee would get the appropriate therapy and then once that's taken care of, he would get his children back. Okay, okay. So she threw something out to you guys that he would get appropriate therapy, I'll use your words. Yeah, Elizabeth. I think the children should get therapy too. Uh, children get, should get therapy too. Or as a group, maybe. Or as a group, okay. I guess we would be pushing for no contact with children under the age of 12. Because they're all his, you know, other than um, Alicia, who might be over 12 by now. Um, that's not going to work because he wants his children back, right? Maybe some kind of, um, or DSS maybe comes into the house once every month or, you know, every so many days to, you know, to ensure everything's running smoothly, maybe some kind of intervention, an intervention plan of some sort. So maybe you somehow want to keep, regardless of if and when he gets custody of his children back, you want to keep the department um, involved in some sense, Absolutely. service plans, et cetera. Yeah. What else? John, do you have I was just going to say, if I was a prosecutor, I guess you kind of deal with as far as a criminal, as far as under uh, 81. Uh, Criminal trial, you probably offer him a deal like to give up his custody of the kids. He's not going to do that, right? Well, that's why it's a deal, though, right? In a criminal case, it's freedom. He's not going to give up freedom for custody of his kids. I'm speaking to you guys. <laughs> what else can we do here? I thought a service plan is it's good. It's a good deal. A service plan, like Jared mentioned. Okay, look, he doesn't want to go to jail. And he wants custody of his kids. And we so want to what? in the jail. We, we don't want him to have custody of his kids. We don't want to get any other kids. That's, yeah, I mean, that's ultimately what it would be. What's that? That's it. Right. It's like negotiating. Like, if I was numb, I would come with the most harsh thing in the world. And then I would... They don't have the evidence. No. And you're telling them that. Go ahead. Go to trial then. Yeah, I want them to. <laughs> uh, because they'd lose. Like, it, it's worth the risk. Fully, like it's it's bad to say like this is horrible, but I would go to trial because I would ninety percent think. Oh, well, what are you gonna give me? I'll admit to. I'll admit like I'll admit I did wrong and I'm a bad parent, but. Okay, I, in, in terms of a criminal disposition, you guys know what I mean by that, right? I would follow the service program, like the what? program they have in the back that they recommended. Like he has to go and complete the um, sexual abusers thing, and then. All three children have to go and have sexual abuse counseling, and then after a certain period of time, like work their way back. Because remember, that's what Nick, the 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 um, court appointed investigator, while the investigator had some problems with the case, um, was recommending that possibly re reunification might might work in this case. That children love their. Um, um, that they bother. They still continue to do well in school. Seem to be, you know, for all other purposes, with father, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, you know, what can we do again, short of actual incarceration and actual, say, termination of parental rights? You know, it doesn't have to be a move that's made tomorrow. A sort of long-range plan that would ensure the um, strengthening of family life is the department's goal so I, really is. I guess the stance I would have is I, I get really stubborn and I think that I would try to do the best I possibly could to get this thing to, to work in order to make sure he doesn't have contact with his children. That's not going to happen. I know. And that's frustrating mm -hmm. to me. And that's frustrating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But what safeguards could you put in place so that the children uh, do not get it if, in fact, they were sexually abused again? 
start with some, some form of uh, supervised visits and then reintegrate that way. Okay, and, and that's their plan. That's the department's plan. You don't have anything to do with supervised visits, but you do have everything to do with the criminal case that's looming against him. You give probation. That, what's that? You give him a form of probation or something. Put him on he the give him more than that. He has, to, he has to be put on the sex offender list. Yeah. Yeah. What else? Check in three times a week with, with the probation officer. Yeah. What are you going to have him admit to if he does an admission to sufficient facts? He's not going to admit to the right to right. So, what, you know. Have him admit to having contact with children under the under, under the certain age. No, relative to these oh, these this case, right? Um, so he's got a battery of of um, crimes against him ranging you know from rape to you know say assault and battery with everything in between indecent and assault and battery each other 14 blah 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 um, besides that um, if convicted the, this jail the suspended sentence this probation like Jeremy said so there are different avenues as well that maybe would satisfy the district attorney here relative to, you know, retribution and rehabilitation, so to speak. As well as what the department mentioned before in terms of uh, service plans and, and, you know, maybe starting with supervised and doing a, a longer range looking at the family for possible reunification, you know, without uh, going to trial or have him admit to um, permanent custody, he doesn't lose parental rights. If he admits to permanent custody, there's no need for a trial. Okay. So the, the, the um, children would be in need of care and protection, but the um, case would be still subject to the annual review and redetermination under 19229B, the annual reviews that the court does, as well as both the children's counsel and father's counsel can come in under 11926, a review and redetermination to get custody uh, back, um, as well as the department. Okay, but they've engaged in all of this counseling. Um, you know, perhaps, you know, one of the reasons, if not the reason for the whole. Uh, um, the sexual abuse that was happening had to do with, uh, the, I don't know, factors like his health, his wife's death, et cetera. If there's anything that, that, that perhaps any form of therapy for father and children uh, uh, able to sort of um, keep the children safe and have the father come back from whatever it was that he has done, uh, then possibly you might have the department even agreeing to custody back sometime um, in the future. These are the toughest cases. I mean, some of the cases, the criminal cases that you've read, for the most part, were not intra-family sexual abuse, right? Or children who've been raped or sexually assaulted by, by others. But it's the um, intra-family child sexual abuse that really presents these major, major issues in, the, in terms of child family state. Um, and one of the major issues that we haven't gotten to yet, and um, I heard that some of you had some problems accessing uh, some of the role of counsel articles. Yes. 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 So I sent some attachments out by email, but I just sent those out, like, uh, I believe, last evening. I think the link says it's an embarrassment. It's, you can't, it's not there anymore. And that was really strange, because it's, it's um, <coughs> one of the links is the Committee for Public Counsel in Massachusetts is the um, agency that would certify you if you wanted to be private counsel representing um, children. And, and parents as well, 
and adults in criminal cases, etc. So they have their own performance standards. Um, I ended up, um, I think I downloaded them and I sent you that. I sent you the um, article I wrote with Judge Blitzman and the other um, child sexual abuse article I wrote for that conference. I think I sent you like Maybe three one, one was already in the material. One, under the unit one was already in material. Yeah. So you know, read those for Thursday, and this is what I want to present to you. So we'll we'll do Thursday role of counsel in terms of uh, Alicia and Jason's counsel, and everybody can you know re relate and talk about this. So, and this is what happened in the case relative to children's counsel. So. Um, you know that when the care, care protection cases start, the day they come in, whether they're emergency or is temporary custody, the court appoints counsel. So the court, the judge had appointed um, counsel for Lee and an, an attorney, court appointed attorney for the children, for all these children, Lisa, Jason, and um, Jonathan. And one of the, um, and I mentioned that the children uh, we just talked about the children were first interviewed by Ellen and Catherine, and, and then they were uh, attempted to be interviewed again by the same team. And um, shortly after that, this is not in the material. Shortly after that, the um, district attorney wanted the children to come down and 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 and, and talk to the victim witness advocates and the district attorney in the district attorney's office. And Uncle, at that point, Uncle Tony had all three children. He brought the children down with their court appointed, and met, I think they met the court appointed attorney there, the whole year, you know. Um, and um, district attorney uh, was uh, attempting to talk with the children, and kind of a big fight erupted. And Tony got pissed off, and he fired children's lawyer on the spot. Now this is the court appointed lawyer. So Uncle Tony says, uh-uh, you know, they're so traumatized and you keep having me bring them down to talk. They don't want to talk anymore, blah, blah, blah. You're fired. And he goes and he um, gets, uh, procures a personal attorney for the children. Um, and then there's a big to-do uh, with the court and the department got all um, messed up over it and said that uh, this was an ethical violation and this and that and uh, that nobody's there for the best interest of the children. So then a guardian ad litem was appointed. I was the guardian ad litem. Um, and so what I'd like you to talk about and consider for, for Thursday is this. So you have two young children. 10 and 12, who are, you know, we talked about, you know, why are they really, comp you know, when you said about competency before, they are really smart, they are really on the ball, their grades never go down, you know, they, they yank out of there, first of all, they live down south somewhere, their mother dies, they come up here, then this happens, then they're, um, Alicia was at grandmother's for a little bit, and then they were all at, um, Uncle, uh, Uncle Tony's. But anyway, they, they are adamant to their attorney that this never happened. I never actually said this. They were asking me leading questions. I thought they meant the, sh I'll just call it the shower incident, which is the, the, the um, what, what Lee and Alicia and Jason told the court appointed investigator. Oh, we weren't talking about that. We were talking about um, this. So you have um, these um, children that, again, um, are very mature, or appear to be very mature, telling their attorney, this is what I want. So think about the role of child's counsel in context like this. When even child's counsel might be thinking, oh, I don't know about this. <laughs> Something's going on here. They're retracting their statements. They love their dad. They don't want to be pulled. The family to be pulled apart. Guilt, shame, etc. All of these factors um, 
but yet they're saying this never happened. They're saying they want to be with dad. They want to be together as a family. I want you to, and they're saying they want uh, me, their attorney, to actively advocate against the state. So what do you do when you're presented um, and you're in a situation like that? So read through the roll of counsel articles I sent you. We'll um, discuss that. I'll let you know, by the way, what the resolution of this case was. We will do medical neglect. Of, we're skipping mental health, skipping whatever. Um, I, we do discuss um, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans kids in the context later on when we get into the um, CRA, the Child Requiring Assistance, so kind of hold off. That in fact, the reading for that was really just a bunch of URLs, websites, so that's fine. So go right to the medical neglect cases for, for next week, and we'll end up doing that IFA, you know, hypothet hypothetical in, context, in the context of the medical neglect cases. So we'll tie this all up. Um, with role of council issues, you know, ethical issues, etc., cetera, um, on Thursday, and then medical neglect um, next week. Um, good? Yeah, yeah. questions? Um, you still need to schedule me for my thing. Yes, yeah. Okay. I need to schedule to everybody. Oh. We, believe it or not, we just started this week <laughs> between Snow and then Jim Panis' uh, dad actually had passed away, so we couldn't even stop last week. We literally just started the first one, but we've got plenty of time. We go through May anyway. Jim's always up there, so you know, send me some. Look at your schedules for like March and April, even into May, and send me some some dates, and I'll start to fill in people. We usually do two or three at a time, so um, I know I've got a couple of people already. Pick on Monday, and I can be there. I know Mondays are pretty open for me. So. Okay. Any other questions about this stuff? Jeff, just a general question? General, but yes, it's, it's something related to the council and uh, the GAL. Yes, so yes. Is, uh, I know this, I understand it's recommended that the jury to invest in the, uh, the interview with the parents that the council be present. But is it, if... if uh, Hold that question until Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs>